If you need prayer, send an email or a private message via the GCF FB Messenger before the worship service begins at 10.30 this morning. A GCFer will try to reach you within the day. If you need prayer over the phone, include your mobile number so we may call you within the day to pray for you. Hello Church family and welcome to our time of online worship to all the regular GCFers and those who have been worshiping with us online the past few weeks. Welcome back and those who are tuned in for the first time, welcome again to the Sunday online worship of GCF Ortigas. I hope and pray that you are ready and eager to sing to pray, and to open God's Word together. Please make yourselves comfortable, ready your musical instruments and your Bibles, and let's join our hearts, our minds, and our voices to worship the Lord together. It says in Psalm 34, verses 4 to 10, I sought the Lord, and He answered me, and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to Him are radiant, and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear Him, and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good, Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. O oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing.
Let's learn this song again and sing in worship to our God. What is our hope in life and death? Christ alone, Christ alone. What is our only confidence? That our souls to Him belong, who holds our days within His hand. What comes apart from His command, and what will keep us to the end? The love of Christ in which we stand. Ang 
ngayon at sa habang panahon sa bawat salin lang ikatapatan mo ay naroon aming Diyos wala nang ang ibang Panginoon ang pag-ibig mo ay tunay at wala Pantay, kapangyarihan mo'y walang katulad Pupurihin ka ng lahat ng may buhay Ulitin po natin Aming Diyos, kay buti mo Mula pa noon hanggang ngayon At sa habang panahon sa bawah Salin lang ikatapatan mo ay naroon aming Diyos. Wala nang ang ibang Panginoon. Ang pag-ibig, ang pag-ibig mo ay tunay at walang kapantay. Kapangyarihan mo'y walang katulad Pupurihin ka ng lahat ng may buhay Deklara po natin Aming Diyos, kay buti mo Mula pa noon hanggang ngayon At sa habang panahon sa bawat salin lang ikatapatan mo ay naroon aming Diyos wala nang ang ibang Panginoon ulitin po natin aming Diyos kay buti mo mula pa noon Hanggang ngayon at sa habang panahon Sa bawat salin lang ikatapatan mo Ay naroon aming Diyos Wala nang ang ibang Panginoon Wala nang ang ibang Panginoon Even as the scattered church, GCF Ortigas continues to support the following. First, missionaries so that they may continue to receive support as they minister. Second, missions organizations including those that cater to the poor and marginalized. Third, new church plants throughout the country. And fourth, organizations that help medical frontliners and the poorer sector of society affected by COVID-19 through our GCF crisis response team. If God lays it on your heart as an act of faith and worship, you can give online as shown on the screen. We pray for cheerful giving, giving as an act of worship from the heart. If you want to designate your giving for COVID-19 efforts, please inform us by email immediately after your online gift. Thank you and God bless you as we continue to worship. Good morning, church. It's time for us to pray as a community as brothers and sisters in Christ. And there is a lot to pray for as we come together virtually during this time of lockdown. So let's bow down our heads and pray. Father, you are the one who controls all things. You are the one who made all things. Through you, all things are maintained and are held in order. There is nothing that happens in our world that, that, that you do not allow. 
There is nothing that takes place that is a surprise to you. And so even this pandemic that we're in is not a surprise to you. In fact, the scripture says that you who cause good also cause calamity in accordance with your purposes. And so, Father, it is to you that we pray this morning. We pray that you might take control of all the facets of this crisis, that you might give wisdom to our leaders, that you might allow the hearts of people to overflow with love for each other, as you are in fact doing now, that you might allow us, the church, to be a better witness and testimony of your love which you have shed abroad in our hearts. We thank you, Father, that although there are some of us who have fallen ill, you continue to preserve most of us in good health. We thank you, Lord, that we have the provisions that we need to be able to sustain ourselves during this lockdown. We thank you, Father, that goods and supplies still flow, although in a much constrained way throughout our city. We thank you, Lord, for the many frontline health workers that are putting their lives at risk in harm's way because they want to serve others and because it is their sworn duty to heal the sick. And so, Lord, they are now ministers uh, ordained by you so that they might be able to heal other people in your place with your power and certainly with your sovereign control. Father, we pray for those who have lost loved ones to this battle, to this war. We pray for the family of Chris Torres, who is now mourning the loss of their mother. We think of those who are still ill, who are still in the hospital because of this COVID-19 disease. We pray, Father, for all of our doctors who are members of GCF, who continue into the, to be in the front lines saving lives every day and battling this virus. We thank you, Father, for those among us who are members of GCF, who attend this church, who continue to do work to find a vaccine, to develop test kits, to manufacture protective equipment, to find a cure, to find a medicine, Lord, that will put an end to this virus. We thank you for their talents, and for their wisdom and knowledge, which we acknowledge comes from you. We continue to pray, Lord, for our church, that you might make us a better witness, Father, to those who are hurting around us. We continue to pray that you sustain uh, the finances of our church and the finances of all of our members, that none may go hungry, that none might be in need, and if there be any, that we might be quick to help them out, to rescue them, to share our resources with them. So identify them for us, O Lord, and lead us to them so that we might help. We pray, Father, for the rest of our worship service, that you might bless the preaching of your word, that you might accept all of our prayers and petitions with gladness in your heart, and that you might answer them, Lord, in accordance with your perfect will. It is your will that we desire, O God, not ours. And so let your will be done in our lives in our city, in our country, and in the world today. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 35, verses 1 through 28. Contend, O Lord, with those who contend with me. Fight against those who fight against me. Take hold of shield and buckler and rise for my help. Draw the spear and javelin against my pursuers, say to my soul, I am your salvation. Let them be put to shame and dishonor who seek after my life. Let them be turned back and disappointed, who devise evil against me. Let them be like chaff before the wind with the angel of the Lord driving them away. Let their way be dark and slippery with the angel of the Lord pursuing them. For without cause they hid their net for me, without cause they dug a pit for my life. Let destruction come upon him when he does not know it, and let the net that he hid and snare him, let him fall into it to his destruction. Then my soul will rejoice in the Lord, exulting in his salvation. 
All my bones shall say, O Lord, who is like you, delivering the poor from him who is too strong for him, the poor and needy from him who robs him. Malicious witnesses rise up. They ask me of things that I do not know. They repay me evil for good. My soul is bereft. But I, when they were sick, I wore sackcloth. I afflicted myself with fasting. I prayed with head bowed on my chest. I went about as though I grieved for my friend or my brother. As one who laments his mother, I bowed down in mourning. But at my stumbling, they rejoiced and gathered. They gathered together against me, wretches whom I did not know, tore at me without ceasing. Like profane mockers at the feast, they gnash at me with their teeth. How long, O Lord, will you look on? Rescue me from, my, from their destruction, my precious life from the lions. I will thank you in the great congregation, in the mighty throng, I will praise you. Let not those rejoice over me who are wrongfully my foes, and let not those wink the eye who hate me without cause, for they do not speak peace, but against those who are quiet in the land they devise words of deceit. They open wide their mouths against me. They say, Aha! Aha! Our eyes have seen it. You have seen, O Lord, be not silent. O Lord, be not far from me. Awake and rouse yourself for my vindication, for my cause, my God and my Lord. Vindicate me, O Lord, my God, according to your righteousness, and let them not rejoice over me. Let them not say in their hearts, Aha, our hearts desire. Let them not say, We have swallowed him up. Let them be put to shame and disappointed altogether, who rejoice at my calamity. Let them be clothed with shame and dishonor, who magnify themselves against me. Let those who delight in my righteousness shout for joy and be glad and say evermore, Great is the Lord who delights in the welfare of his servant. Then my tongue shall tell of your righteousness and of your praise all day long. May the Lord add his blessings upon the reading of his word. Beloved Church, we continue in our sermon series on the book of Psalms, which we've entitled Songs to Keep Our Life in Tune. This morning, our message is in Psalm 35, and I have entitled it Turning Pity into Praise. Through this psalm, David admonishes us to turn our pity into praise by converting our complaints about our negative circumstances into earnest prayers for the Lord's deliverance, rescue, and vindication, so that we can see Him come to our aid for the praise of His glorious grace. The psalm is composed of three laments with a similar theme of the psalmist experiencing contention, injustice, and then oppression. Each of the three laments show a common structure of complaint, petition, and then praise. The psalm contains very strong language in its petitions, and this is why it is considered as one of the imprecatory psalms. But we, were, we must remember Beloved, that David lived and wrote these psalms during a time when he was on war footing. And this should explain the strong language that he uses here. Furthermore, let us remember that the Lord was using the nation of Israel as an agent for executing his judgment upon the Canaanite people who were all idolatrous and rebelling against him. I say this because some of us might be tempted to use the language of the imprecatory Psalms as license to pray violence against our own enemies. Beloved, this should never be. 
As Paul would say, God forbid. As a redeemed people of a loving God, we are commanded to love our enemies and to pray for those who persecute us. Our Lord in Luke chapter 6 verses 27 and 28 said that. He said, but I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. You see, the point of the psalm is that even if God's people are not exempt from threats, we have a God who always has our best interest in mind. And he will act in a manner that is for our good and for his glory. So let's go to the first point of this psalm. And there will be three in this message. First, David prayed and lamented, Deliver me from contention. And that will take the whole section of verses 1 through 10. But firstly, he prayed, Deliver me from those who fight against me. Verses 1 to 3. Contend, O Lord, with those who contend with me. Fight against those who fight against me. Take hold of shield and buckler and rise for my help. Draw the spear and javelin against my pursuers. Say to my soul, I am your salvation. The Lord promised his people that he will contend for them and defend them. Isaiah records this promise actually in Isaiah 49, 25, when he wrote, For thus says the Lord, Even the captives of the mighty shall be taken, and the prey of the tyrant be rescued. For I will contend with those who contend with you, and I will save your children. That's ref referring to the Israelites. In Psalm 91, 4, this is what we read. He will cover you with pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. In, his, in Israel's history, God almost always came to the aid of his people and literally fought for them. In Exodus 14, 25, it says, God was clogging the chariot wheels of the Egyptians so that they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, let us flee from before Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. Of course, in Joshua chapter 10, 42, all of his victories were summed up in this verse. And Joshua captured all these kings and their land at one time because the Lord God of Israel fought for Israel. This is the basis for the psalmist's confidence in making this prayer request. He was obviously facing opposition, and while it is not clear what specific event this was in David's life, it is clear that even God's anointed is appointed to contention from time to time. We who trust in David's greater son, Jesus Christ, for our eternal salvation are also appointed to face the same. In John 15, 18, our Lord said, If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. But like David, we should find comfort in God's promised protection. Isaiah records that in Isaiah 12, 2, where he wrote, Behold, God is my salvation, and I will trust and will not be afraid, for the Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. Then David prays for deliverance from those who seek my life, he said, in verses 4 to 6. Let them be put to shame and dishonor who seek after my life. Let them be turned back and disappointed who devise evil against me. Let them be like chaff before the wind, with the angel of the Lord driving them away. 
and let their dark way let their way be dark and slippery with the angel of the Lord pursuing them. David was a king during a time when Israel was surrounded by enemies. So being chased for his life was a frequent theme during his reign and praying for God's protection was an oft-repeated petition. In Psalm 40, verse 14, he prayed, Let those be put to shame and disappointed altogether who seek to snatch away my life. In Psalm 70, verse 2, he prayed, Let them be put to shame and confusion who seek my life. In Psalm 71, 13, he prayed, May my accusers be put to shame and consumed with scorn and disgrace. They may be covered who seek my hurt. And God did answer this request often and turned back David's enemies many times in supernatural ways. Yet, it was not an enemy from without, but an enemy from within that fell the mighty King David. In 2 Samuel 11, we read the episode of his adultery with Bathsheba, and he fell to that. And while he did not lose his life, the sword never departed from his house as a judgment decreed by God himself. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, Nathan speaking for the Lord said to David, Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house, because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. For us today, not many of us have enemies who actually seek our lives. Although this is not improbable, it can happen. But our real enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, 1 Peter 5 eight says. Our comfort, as it was David's, is that we can expect to see the angel of the Lord, which is an expression of the pre-New Testament um, appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ, the angel of the Lord driving the away like chaff before the wind. You see, no one can snatch us out of his hand, Jesus said in John 10, 28. And then David prayed for deliverance from those who entrapped me, verses 7 to 8. For without cause, they hid their net for me. Without cause, they dug a pit for my life. Let destruction come upon him when he does not know it. And let the net that he hid and snare him, let him fall into it to his destruction. As a wartime sovereign, David was a polarizing figure. For his subjects, he was a hero. But for his enemies, he was an object of abject hatred. Psalm 69.4 says, More in number than the hairs of my head are those who hate me without cause. Psalm 109.3 says, They encircle me with words of hate and attack me without cause. He laments greatly about this fact here and raises his complaint to the only one who can really do something about it. The God who is powerful enough to entrap those who hate him without cause. Now, there might be some of us today who face those who hate us for reasons we cannot understand. As followers of Jesus Christ, we are sure to encounter persecution just by living godly lives. Paul said that in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. That's a promise. We were saved so that we can proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light, Peter wrote in 1 Peter 2.9. But John said in his gospel, everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works be exposed. That's in John chapter 3 verse 20. And this is why we will be hated in this world. That, by the way, was promised by the Lord in John 15, 25. He said, but the, Lord that is written in their, but the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. He quotes this psalm. 
you know, people, this world, they hate us and the Lord we serve, and they will try to entrap us to destroy our testimony and smear the holy name of our Lord God. However, like David, we have a God we can call on to deliver us from their schemes. And so in verses 9 to 10, David says, I will exult in your salvation. Then my soul will rejoice in the Lord, exulting in his salvation. All my bones shall say, O Lord, who is like you, delivering the poor from him who is too strong, for him the poor and needy, from him who robs him. Now, when David uses the word then in this verse, then my soul will rejoice. He is not setting the Lord's answer to his prayer as a condition to his rejoicing in the Lord. Rather, it is a clear expression of his confidence that the Lord will surely come to his aid and save him from his enemies. His rejoicing is with his entire being and it extols the Lord's compassion for the poor and the disadvantaged. This paragraph of exaltation also suggests that when the Lord comes to the aid of his anointed, his glory will be manifested in his act of deliverance and thanksgiving will be ascribed to his name. It is such a comfort, beloved, for us who call him Lord, that when he acts for the best interest of his people, he will at the same time be glorified and praised. Wonderful truth. In the second lament that we will look at in this psalm, this is through verses 11 through 18, David pleads with the Lord. He says, rescue me from injustice. Firstly, he says, rescue me from malicious witnesses, verses 11 to 12. Malicious witnesses rise up. They ask me of things that I do not know. They repay me evil for good. My soul is bereft. Now, David describes here a scene from a courtroom where there are witnesses who are intent on causing him harm with malice aforethought. Literally, those who are breathing out violence towards him. They confront him with things that I do not know or things that are not true, repaying him evil for the good that he has done towards them, causing his heart to grieve. This language suggests that these malicious witnesses are actually friends of his, to whom he has shown goodwill in the past but who are now arrayed against him, seeking his condemnation. As Christians today, we are not exempted from this kind of situation. As is often the case, we are brought to court sometimes, even by the very people we love or hold dear as friends, confronting us with unfair or untruthful statements. It is a reality that we face. And then David said, rescue me from those who I care for, verses 13 to 14. But I, when they were sick, I wore sackcloth. I afflicted myself with fasting. I prayed with head bowed on my chest. I went about as though I grieved for my friend or my brother. As one who laments his mother, I bowed down in mourning. These verses describe Even clearer that these malicious witnesses, which he referred to in verse 11, are actually close friends of David. So close that he mourned over them when they were sick and genuinely cared for their welfare and well-being. In our lives today, beloved, many of us can relate with these feelings of injustice that David describes. We too have shown deep concern for the welfare of some of our friends only to see them betray us by saying something against us that is not true, all in the furtherance of their own selfish interest. When that happens, it is as if that friend died and caused us deep grief. 
like someone tearing away a part of us with excruciating pain. Then David prayed continually. They are those who still gathered together against me, these friends of his. David further laments this in verses 15 to 16. But at my stumbling, they rejoiced and gathered. They gathered together against me, wretches whom I did not know, tore at me without ceasing, like profane mockers at the feast. They gnash at me with their teeth. David further laments, as I said, how unfairly he was treated by these friends of his who gathered together against him, tearing at him, mocking him, being angry at him. There are many candidates for these roles in the life of David. Was it Saul? Was he referring to Saul, his father-in-law king? Was it Absalom, his son, who rebelled against him? Or maybe it was Ahithophel, his trusted advisor, who, by the way, was the father of Eliam, who is the father of Bathsheba. Blood is really thicker than water. He sided with Absalom during the rebellion, you will recall. Maybe it's him. Whoever they were, they caused David extreme pain and distress. As we read these verses spent millennia ago, I'm sure you feel as I do, how accurate they describe some of our experiences today. Even as believers in Christ, some of us have had friends who betrayed us by repairing, repaying our goodwill with evil intent. Some of us have been victims of injustice. We have been on the receiving end of court suits, sometimes, as I mentioned earlier, even from relatives and close family friends. So we can all relate with what David says next. He actually says, yet I will praise you for your rescue, verses 17 through 18. First he laments, how long, O Lord, will you look on? Rescue me from their destruction, my precious life. From the lions, I will thank you in the great congregation, in the mighty throng, I will praise you. How long, O oh Lord, is what uh, today's generation will call a rant. David is ranting before the Lord with a strong tone of impatience about what he sees as a delay in God's action. Now, he, he often does this. David is a bit of an impatient person. In Psalm 6, 3, he says, My soul also is greatly troubled, but you, O Lord, how long? In Psalm 13, 1, he said, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? In Psalm 74, 10, he says, How long, O God, is the foe to scoff? In Psalm 89, 46, he said, How long, O Lord, will you hide yourself forever? In Psalm 94, verse 3, he said, O Lord, how long shall the wicked, how long shall the wicked exalt? He was definitely an impatient man. But David knows more than anyone that God's timing is sometimes different from his and always better than his. He has learned, I suppose, over many situations like this to wait for the unfolding of God's perfect will. In Psalm 25, 5, he said, Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. In Psalm 27, 14, he said, Wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. In Psalm 37, 7, he said, be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. In Psalm 130 verse 5, he said, I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. Then he cries out with confidence to the Lord. Rescue me, he cried out. And again, thanks the Lord as he expectantly waits 
for his rescue so that he can praise him in the great congregation in the mighty throng. Beloved, David is showing us here that sometimes it is okay to rant before our God and to express with genuine emotion our frustration over unfair situations. But like him, we must learn to wait on the Lord for his will to be done in his perfect way and in his perfect time. Now we are at the last lament in this psalm, and it's contained in verses 19 through 28. He cries out, vindicate me from oppression. Firstly, from those who hate me without cause. He repeats this theme, verses 19 through 21. Let not those rejoice over me who are wrongfully my foes. And let not those wink the eye who hate me without cause. For they do not speak peace. But against those who are quiet in the land, they devise words of deceit. They open wide their mouths against me. They say, aha, aha, our eyes have seen it. David returns to this theme of facing those who hate him without cause. Or actually what that means is, or those who hate him for reasons that are not true or are not valid. He repeats this here to further stress the unjust and oppressed state that he was in. Those who are oppressing him are wrongfully his foes. You might wonder why did he say wrongfully? Well, I think it's he means those who are his enemies for invalid reasons or because of lies. He says something like that in Psalm 38, 19. But my foes are vigorous, they are mighty, and many are those who hate me wrongfully, meaning the same sense, that they hate him for reasons that are not valid or not true. He drips with sarcasm here when he refers to his foes as those who wink the eye or who say, aha, aha, our eyes have seen it. This indicates that their charges and accusations against David are false and made up because we see the words, they, defy, they devise words of deceit and speak against those who are quiet in the land. They are contentious people and they speak lies. Next, David cries out, vindicate me according to your righteousness. Now, this is wonderful. This is surprising and wonderful. Verses 22 to 26. You have seen, O Lord, be not silent. O Lord, be not far from me. Awake and rouse yourself for my vindication, for my cause, my God, and my Lord. Very personal. Vindicate me, O Lord. My God, according to your righteousness, and let them not rejoice over me. Let them not say in their hearts, Aha, our hearts desire. And let them not say, We have swallowed him up. David cries out to God, who is witness to everything, and who surely sees the unfairness in his enemy's schemes and his affliction, just like he saw the affliction of the Israelites in Egypt, which is recorded in Exodus chapter 3. God called Moses because he had heard the cries of the Israelites enslaved in Egypt. Now David worships this God who sees everything. So David freely laments to his heavenly father, as he often did, just like any son would cry out to his earthly dad. In Psalm 28, 1, David said, to you, O Lord, I call, be my rock, be not deaf to me, lest if you be silent to me, I become like those who go down to the pit. In Psalm 10, 1, he said, why, O Lord, do you stand far away? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? He cries out for justice to be accorded to him, for God to vindicate. He even uses extreme, almost blasphemous language like awake and rouse yourself as if God has fallen asleep, which by the way, he never does. Psalm 121.4 says, before he, behold, 
he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. Now, this kind of language merely suggests the depths of his oppression and the urgency with which he seeks the Lord's justice. He does not ask for his way or for his wishes to be granted. Not, not so. And he does not ask for this despite the desperation, the, the desperation that he had to get them. He was desperate as it was to get what he has petitioned, what he has prayed for. Instead, he asked for God to vindicate him according to God's righteousness or according to his perfect will. For me, this tells us the secret behind why David always seems to get his prayers answered favorably. Well, it's this. This is the secret. He sincerely desired for God to respond according to what was right for the situation. For the situation, to what was right according to his eyes, to what was in accordance with his perfect will, and what would glorify him the most. That's what David meant by vindicate me according to your righteousness. Let your will be done, O Lord, unto me, was basically what David cried. And this brings us to his final cry of praise. He says here in the last uh, two verses, I will delight in your righteousness and your delight in my welfare. Verses 27 and 28. Let those who delight in my righteousness shout for joy and be glad and say evermore, Great is the Lord who delights in the welfare of his servant. Then my tongue shall tell of your righteousness and of your praise all the day long. For David... The resolution of his problems were not as important as God's name being glorified. When he exclaims, let those who delight in my righteousness shout for joy and be glad, it was not to trumpet his own uprightness before men. It was not so. It was a call for God's people to say evermore, great is the Lord who delights in fair of his servant. His desire was for God to be glorified in his deliverance from contention, his rescue from injustice, and his vindication from oppression. His confidence in God's ability to come to his aid was so great that he expressed thanksgiving and praise even before these prayers of his were answered. Because nothing in this psalm indicates to us that God had already responded favorably to his cries. David just knew that he would. Because of this confidence in the goodness of God, he ended these laments with a cry of praise. Then my tongue shall tell of your righteousness and of your praise all the day long. What a wonderful psalm. With a poignant lament before a gracious God, David wrote. By way of application, I think there are three things we can remember here. And I sum up as follows. Firstly, when you encounter contention in your own life, pray for God's deliverance. And then praise Him for His sure salvation, both in the present life and of course, in eternity. Now, him, his timing may not be your timing, and his way of resolving the situation may not, may not be your way. David never prayed for that. He prayed for God's will to be done. He knew that God's will was perfect and good, and that God will will only that which is the best for us and that which will glorify him. Secondly, when you encounter injustice, and you will, pray for his rescue and praise him for when he takes you out of these unfair situations, whether he does so soon or later, or maybe never, or maybe just in the future, in eternity. 
There will always be injustice in the world, and beloved, we are not exempt from this. And as I mentioned earlier, some of you, many of us, have probably experienced this injustice, but you see, our God is a just God, and He sees all, and He will accord to us the justice that we deserve. Now, whether He gives that to us in this life or in the next, that's up to Him. But whatever He wills, it'll be good. Number three, when you encounter oppression from those who hate you without cause, and there will be those people, beloved, pray for His vindication, not according to what you want, but according to His righteousness. And praise Him for attending to your welfare. See, God is praised when He attends to His people's needs. That's wonderful. I always quote what John Piper said, God is most glorified when we are most satisfied in Him. And you know, He will attend to your welfare in this present life and even more so in eternity. Father, we thank you for this message this morning. And we pray now that we, like David, might learn to pour out our pity, our lament, our complaints unto you and leave them in your hands so that you might do unto us which is best for us and that which will glorify you the most. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue to sing. Declare that He is God. You are not a God created by human hands. You are not a God dependent on any mortal man. You are not a God in need of anything we can give by your plan that's just the way it is sing from our hearts you are not a god created by human hands you are not a god dependent on any mortal man you are not a god in need of anything we can give by your plan that's just the way it is all together you are God alone from before time began you were on your throne you are God alone and right now when the good times and bad church you're the only God whose power none can contend you're the only God whose name and praise will never end you're the only God who's worthy of everything we can give you are God that's just the way it is you are God and bad you are on your throne you are God alone with one voice unchangeable unshakable unstoppable that's what you are unchangeable unshakable Unstoppable, that's what you are. Let's sing. 